Chris Massarwell, good to see you, my friend. Ah, I feel the same. Good to see you. You doing all right? I'm doing fine, yeah. Are you having the same what bizarre weather that we're having in the lower Midwest? It's like 70 degrees one day, then we have like an ice storm. Yes. Like <laughs> I got caught in it all on the way to Montreal, man. It was terrible. Oh, so what's it like in Montreal in February? Is it like 30 <laughs> below zero? Yeah. No, it was really tough, actually. Kind of a blizzard, too. Is it true there, like, that they have tunnels under the street so you, you don't have to be outside very much? Yeah, I did a little of that. Whole <laughs> shopping areas, man. You don't even have to emerge. Otherwise, your face freezes off in, like, 15 minutes. <laughs> 15, man, I don't know. Five. <laughs> um, so wh- let's do our introductions, if anybody doesn't know who we are famous folks uh, that we that we seem to be. Uh, <laughs> my name is Daniel Kaufman. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State. This is the Sophia program, and this is my partner, Crispin Sartwell. Greetings. And you are from where? Uh, Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I'm in my office right now. And, oh, is that your office? Yeah. Shit, man, you have a nice office. Yeah, I, I like it too. I'm in an attic uh, of a... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm magnificently peripheral, but I love my office actually. Wow, that looks like a, that looks like a house. I mean, that looks like a sweet. I mean, it's a it's a house, a row house uh, out here. Yeah, or a duplex. My office looks like you know a cubicle, a corporate like you know. It's in one of these buildings where the windows don't open and 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 yeah. <laughs> I've got character over here, man. Um, in addition to being a, a professor. Uh, Crispin is a well-known public intellectual. <laughs> I'm saying this not to flatter you, but to set up the fact that we're going to talk about one of your pieces that has appealed in the, appeared in the popular press, not an academic, uh, not an academic work. Um, so one of the venues you write for is this magazine, Splice Today, which actually I'm not familiar with. What what is Splice? Do you, can, can you say just a word about what what this is? Yeah, I mean. Uh... I, I like it because it has amazingly eclectic stuff, uh, like all across the political spectrum, for one thing. It's edited by a guy who was my editor at the Baltimore City paper in the 80s. Oh, that's and interesting. The, yeah, and at the New York Press in the early 2000s. So I was a music critic for both of those. Um, I, re- I remember the New York Press. Does that still exist? I don't think it does. He owned it, actually, and he sold it. Uh, it persisted for a little while, but I think it's dead now. Like, I mean, is the yeah. Village Voice even publishing? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I haven't yeah. lived in New York since 1999, and, you know, when I go back, I just visit my folks, so I, I kind of don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, but I, the New York Press was sort of like another kind of effort at, like, an indie paper, sort of like The Voice, right? All The Voice, by that point, was a very established... Right, and the New York Press kind of positioned itself as a right-wing version of the uh, yeah, yeah. Of the and stuff. Yeah, and knowing how right-wing you are, of course. Um, uh, well, I'm complex on that. You are not I, right-wing. I, I don't know how people label you that way. It's just ridiculous. Well, true. I hope so. I hope it's um, ridiculous. Okay, so you got this piece in Splice, um, to, and, and it's um, – the, the essay is called Why They Suck – how Michelangelo made the Reformation necessary. Now, maybe say a word first about this Why They Suck series, because I gather that, that this is something you're doing, like a number of installments under the rubric of Why They Suck. Yeah. So, could you maybe talk a little bit about what that is? Okay, well, um, I guess, like, since I was a kid, you know, I'm a critic at heart, let's say, and I also um, – tend not to take other people's opinions particularly seriously, especially if, <laughs> especially if they're in uh, consensus. Uh, so, I, I mean, this is just another, say, shot at taking out reputations that I think are insanely overblown to the point where you can't even assess the quality of the work because everyone is just spending hundreds of years uh, in nonstop praise. It's, and... So I mean I've take I've uh, I started off with music I guess I I took Bob Dylan was the first I did Springsteen. But I uh, thought you love Bob Dylan. I hate Bob Dylan. You hate Bob Dylan. Okay. I did. <laughs> so do I. So do I. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think you'll like my piece then. You know, go to Splice today and search why they suck and you'll see some. Uh, 
<laughs> I did some painters. I did some philosophers, Plato, uh, Wittgenstein. Yeah. Uh, who I just think their reputations are absurd. And it's like you can't say that or you can't, you know, without disqualifying yourself. So I guess I'm disqualifying myself. Right. So, so this is – the targets here are things that are sort of widely praised. Yes. It's not just stuff that you really can't stand, right? Yes. There's a methodological essay on, uh, you know, assigning suck quotients to the great figures of history. It's, it's basically reputation, uh, you know, over – or it, it, it's my – completely objective assessment of their quality <laughs> in relation to their reputation. Well, the, yeah, okay. So the reason I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a fan of, of going after, you know, big, big popular targets. I mean, that's, that's definitely a good thing. The reason I was asking was I, I read something of you or somewhere where you were seriously dissing prog rock and, oh, hell yeah. and, and I, I, I'm <laughs> going to do a whole dialogue with you on this because okay. if you think, if you think King Crimson's a bad band, you're uh, very confused. You're a very confused person. So we'll have to talk about uh, we'll yeah, have to talk about that under another under another. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was fighting with my friends about this through the whole seventies, man. They were listening to King Crimson. I was listening. To, I don't know what I was listening. To, New but York see, Dolls, or yeah, but I listened to that too. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, it's to like it totally for different reasons. But we'll, we'll have that. We'll have that conversation another time. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So on the so but. Let me ask you one last thing about the column. So in this one, it's not just about why Michelangelo sucks. I mean, there's a lot of other interesting stuff that you have to say about the Renaissance and about humanism and Christianity. Yes. Information. Is that typical of the series or is this one broader? Do you, do you do more with this one than you typically do? Well, I mean, I didn't do anything quite like that with Dylan, let's say, but I'm liable to go off on that any, you know, in anything I write almost, you know what I mean? Like, I, it, and and I, I did. I wanted to frame, you know, Michelangelo in his era and his kind of, you know, his role and maybe the religious debates or religious visions of his era uh, and rivalries of his era, right? And in the context of the papacy of that era and all that sort of thing. But yeah, I'll often go sort of off toward intellectual history from almost anywhere, I guess. Because it was all the sort of stuff that was con it was all the sort of tangents you went off of that I that w w struck me as so interesting and why I wanted to do the dialogue. So yeah. maybe you could just sort of t talk us through brief for people you you know we'll link to the essay, um, but talk us through a little bit what are the central ideas slash arguments in the essay and how do you get from the Michelangelo sucks to the Reformation? Right. <sighs> Well, I mean, this raises the biggest sort of uh, intellectual history questions about that era in Europe and about maybe, you know, in the history of Christianity of that era. Um, I get, and I, and I should say that in various ways, and I have to think about exactly why this is, I'm still trying to contemplate it. I, I feel identified with no Northern Europe, both in terms of the art uh, so I tend to gravitate more toward figures like Van Eyck, let's say, or Durer than the Italians, although I love some of the Italian painters of that period as well. Um, and also I'm, att I'm, att I'm attracted to Protestant Christianity in various ways. Um, I am myself a Quaker and uh, I'm, you know, and I find the criticisms of the Catholic church by figures like Luther in that era you know, with all, with all Luther's problems and drawbacks, extremely compelling. So one thing to say about, you know, Michelangelo or high Renaissance art in Italy at that time is it's devoted, I mean, the, the clientele is, you know, for Michelangelo specifically, is the, is the papacy at the most corrupt moment in the whole history of the thing, which is saying something, okay? Um, now, really, more more corrupt than when than the collaboration with the Nazis. <laughs> all right, all right, okay. Yeah. Um, more directly, I mean, more. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, <laughs> just I don't. Yeah. This is not a competition. I just thought yes, I, that's true. Okay, never mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, more sort of thoroughly corrupt in terms of the whole hierarchy being kind of. I mean, and of course, there's the child sex scandals and things as well. There, and many moments before. 
you know, the Renaissance as well, of course, and many, you know, that are not so problematic. But, um, you know, Michelangelo is working in the context of that funding situation. Right. Uh, and that vision of Christianity that's being developed, you know, as, as, the, as the papal interpretation of Christianity at the moment that Northern Europe starts exploding in revulsion uh, about this whole world, you know? And I mean, so that's, now that's not to discredit the art entirely or something like that. I mean, that's something you sort of have to know about the art, I think. Like, who is it made for? Which doesn't necessarily mean that it's not even critical of that in some ways, or could be. Um, but that's not enough to, you know, discredit it aesthetically per se. But I just think people are, very, very much tend now to yank it out of that historical context. Um, you know, and then there's, I guess, the philosophical context of it or the uh, intellectual context. And I, I mean, I really see Michelangelo as representing Neoplatonism on the rise in, uh, you know, the Italy of that time, uh, like uh, Marsilio Ficino or whatever. Um, and I think they're experimenting with leaving Christianity, frankly, or they're desperately trying to synthesize their version of uh, pagan antiquity and Platonism specifically with Christi the teachings of Christianity. And I think it's pretty strained. I mean, there's all, you know, if we're talking about humanism, there's all kinds of different ways to try to, you know, combine antiquity with um, pagan antiquity with Christianity. Some of them are better than others, I think are more plausible, but uh, Michelangelo's vision which we, you know, I, in the, I rag on his depiction of Christ in the last judgment and stuff like this as being kind of like, you know, Channing Tatum as Jesus. Okay. It was like big bruising, uh, pagan gods really floating around, uh, the clouds and, and sort of claiming to be, uh, representatives of the Christian religion. So, Anyway, that's that's my summary of the problems, I suppose. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting pieces here, and, and now that you've talked through this, it's even more interesting to me. It's it's funny, just how I just see the whole arc, the whole arc, so differently from you. So it's like you know, I I also prefer Northern Renaissance painting, but I vastly prefer non-Northern Christianity, um, um, partly because. Um, um, in my view, that the Reformation was revisionist and 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 to a great degree modern and not not authentically in terms of if you were going to go back historically. Okay, I mean Luther Luther famously wanted to just like cut whole books out of the New Testament. Um, um, in other words, he wanted to do a revisionist version of the text. Um, and so and so you know I I I I know that Protestants, especially evangelicals, like to say no 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 this is the actual Christianity as practiced by the apostles. But anybody who knows historically and theologically knows that that's just a lot of nonsense, right? I mean, I mean, that's just not true. That's too um, strong, I think, a lot of nonsense. I don't know. I, mean, I do have a degree in Near Eastern Studies, and I specialize in the, st the Second Temple period, and it's a pretty shaky uh, 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 line to take. Um, I, I, but this, that then depends on what Christianity is. Yes. And then and when it started, right? And then you can have a whole argument about that. I mean, I would want to argue that you really don't get Christianity until pretty deep into some of the early Vatican councils and that what you have before is a sort of a Jewish is a Jewish sect that then migrates and migrates and then eventually splits off, but I mean that that what we you know, in other words, the word Christianity itself, what the referent of that is is going to be really complicated and, and subject to all kinds of disagreement. Fair enough. I don't want us to get all lost up into that, but I only I'm saying it because it's just interesting how the the background you bring to how you view this history and stuff really affects the uh, the way you perceive the the stuff in it, right? Completely. <laughs> um, um, and so, uh, but I want to work right. within your framework because this yeah. is I want to talk about your well, essay. So, all right. So, but one thing I would say is I, I'm not in a position maybe to assess who's truer to the church fathers or who's truer, truer to the gospels or something like that. Although I, I probably would 
stroll still toward Luther on some of that. But one thing I would say is that if you read the Gospels and then you look at the institutions of the Catholic Church of that era, or you basically look at the Catholic Church in many ways as just a straight right. inheritor of the Rome of the Roman Empire or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean the the political transformation of Christianity and yeah. the transformation of it to, um, you know, a dominant, yeah, hierarchy trying yeah. to control Europe, and the Pope as a kind of emperor of the church and things yeah. like this. I mean, it's hard not. I mean, it's hard. It'd be yeah. hard to read the Gospels as authorizing yeah. that or expecting that. Right? Yeah, but of course, I mean, what I would say there and and and. Again, we shouldn't probably go on this too long, but um, look, I mean, the New Testament is not a blueprint for a civilization, and that's because the people who, who, who figure into that thought the world was about to end, okay? So then when the world didn't end, <laughs> then when the world didn't end, the, the, nascent, the, the nascent Christendom had to figure out, okay, what does a Christian civilization look like? Right. It's not surprising to me that at least part of it was patterned over the priest. You know, they, they went to look back to the priesthood of the Old Testament um, because unlike the New Testament, the Hebrew Bible is a blueprint for a civilization. Right. Yes. Um, okay. And so, you know, the, to me, Catholic, you know, the, Catholic, the early Catholic and Orthodox uh, religions are what you get. When you are hitherto, this wasn't supposed to be a civilization religion, now says, well, we have to be a civilization now because the world didn't end like we were expecting it to, right? Um, right. <laughs> but like, I, also, <laughs> I mean, I also say this. It, it's a transformation of a religious group or, a, you know, if it's a, it's a Jewish uh, sect or whatever it may be, that's in rebellion against the authorities of that era, both yes. uh, within Judaism and within yep. the Roman Empire, yep. uh, and is expressing uh, you know, highly critical uh, sentiments about their oppressive uh, capacities and stuff like that, and, and that put Jesus to death. And then, you know, okay, if you now think, okay, we've got to become, the, we have to see how, uh, what a Christian world is like, well, it, uh, it it may be that convert the emperor. That's the best. That's the, you know. Yes. Okay. So you know <laughs> that kind of worldly power. Um, I mean, I understand the sort. You sort of have to make some kind of peace with how you're going to exercise that once you have it and stuff like that. Uh, but then there's the details of how that's being operated. Say right at that moment. Yeah. With the sale of indulgences for yeah. Example, yeah. Or, yeah. You know, a, a thousand signs that, you know, and, and if you just read the Sermon on the Mount a couple of times and then gaze squarely at, you know, the outfits and the arts and the buildings of the Catholic Church, you'd think to yourself, well, is this Christianity or is this the betrayal of Christianity? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, that's, are we having a Catholic Protestant argument now? Man? Yeah, it's funny. I feel like I'm the Jew defending the Catholics. It's, it's, it's sort of hilarious. I have a Jewish background too, right? So it's, it's just uh, really funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you ask me, you know, if you ask me who I thought was worse, you know, the sort of the the, the ref the forces of the Reformation or the Counter Reformation, I don't know if I could give you an answer. I mean, you know, I, I mean. They're, they're all pretty awful. I mean, you know, so in terms of the, in terms of from my people's perspective, right? Um, um, they're true, all awful. true. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's an anti-Semitic problem too in the Reformation. Of yeah, Paul. yeah. Oh, yeah. Luther and was a notorious. Yeah. yeah. So, but let's um, so let's get back to the uh, to the essay. So, let's first just start with the art part of it. Okay. So, because that's very interesting. And look, people like the Italian Renaissance art is probably one of the more popular art, you know, art art historical forms. After Impressionism, I would think it's probably the right. most popular because it's easy to like. It's very pretty, right, on its face. And um, it's, it's really supposed to be the culmination of the whole Western tradition in art. It often yeah. has Talk that kind a little of bit about the difference between Italian and Northern Renaissance art. Um, and maybe we can start bringing in the discussion of what, how you understand humanism yeah specifically first in the artistic context and then we can broaden it out okay to talk about humanism uh more broadly but what is your give me a little little sketch of your views on italian versus northern renaissance such that you fall on the side of the northern in terms of right. your tastes and then also 
the role that humanism plays in both. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, one thing I just say is like I found myself from very early just gravitating toward the a lot of northern painters, northern Baroque, especially like Rembrandt and Vermeer, and then just you know looking at with I mean when I was even a kid, like let's say Bruegel or the uh, you know the unbelievable weirdness of Hieronymus Bosch. Yeah. Or, but you know, and then a little later on gazing at, you know, Van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait or whatever and going, this is some kind of miracle. Like, this is, how is yeah. this possible? Van, um, Van Eyck and Van der Weyden, I think, are the, peak, yeah. are the peak of Northern painting, and I would say Italian paint, uh, 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 Renaissance painting, period, at least in my, my huh. estimation. Durer always struck me as kind of a synthesis of yeah. time to synthesize Italian and Northern. Sure. Right, and... And there were very clumsy attempts to do that, but Durer's is masterful, of course. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I look at at that whole at the whole Northern tradition as kind of turned outward into the material world. I mean, I think that if you had to, you know, summarize it in a word, it's a realist tradition. Uh, you know, not at every moment, uh, but it tends to go. I mean, to the Northern Renaissance and Baroque, we owe the invention of still life painting and landscape painting. Um, and really, you know, the exploration of portraiture and stuff, that, of course, was also going on in Italy. Careful depiction of interiors. Yes. Absolutely, you know, meticulous depictions of yes. drapery and clothes. and Exactly. And, well, and, and also realism in the sense of a non-idealization of the human subjects, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Rembrandt is a beautiful example of that later on. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, like, if you, if you compare a Rembrandt to a Raphael Madonna, the, the Rembrandt is like a average young woman from the Netherlands or whatever, right. doing right. what they do. And Raphael's is beautifully idealized into a kind of, you know, celestial woman or a, right. a perfect representative of beauty um, and maternity. And, you know, so I, that's, that's the first difference I would say is, you have a real, a realistic versus an idealizing tradition, um, and you know the. I, I would say one big reason for the idealizing tradition in Italy certainly is the influence of Plato, as that picks up more and more. And it's like, not an accident that the idealization is in the manner of classical, yes, antiquity. Yes, precisely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And and I mean, so the the the, the, Renas the Renaissance of classical antiquity takes a little longer in the North and they're less impressed by it. I mean, it's almost a cult in Italy, right? I mean, if, if Ficino again, or later on, even Winkelmann and stuff like that. Uh, well, that's, that's not Italy. Well, but it's, anyway. And it's across the, the culture, right? I mean, the architecture yeah. is classical. I mean, it, the, there is a wholesale revival, right? Yes. And I think like Northern Renaissance painting is developing and art is developing as quickly but in quite different directions, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree yeah. with that. It's, okay. almost like, it's almost like the way I've described it, you know, and for, for years, I don't know if, if you've ever taught this stuff, but for years I taught art history at, um, when I was in graduate school. And, um, you know, it was part of one of my teaching gigs that I had. Good, and, yeah. Um, I used to teach it almost as if, you know, the Northern Renaissance was more a natural organic development out of the late medieval Gothic in terms of style, whereas the Italian was almost a, was almost a complete sort of like um, um, revivalist movement. Yes. Of something earlier. I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you, would you describe both as being human, both as being humanistic, but just humanistic in different ways? Because that's the way that I tend to think about it. And it's part of the reason why I'm not sure how I feel about your thesis, right? I see. I tend to think that both Northern and Italian, I think that all, all Renaissances are humanistic, at least the ones historically that we've had have been humanistic. They've, the humanism has just been expressed in a different manner. Now, are you of a different view on that? And if so, how do you understand humanism in painting in the Renaissance? Yeah, that's a hard one. Okay, now it's certainly true that in the North as in the South, I think you get more emphasis on the human body, the hu you know, and, and, and more emphasis, but a, as you go on. But I, I do think that as, as we're talking about the details of draperies, 
you know, still life landscape on which they're lavishing at least as much attention as they're lavishing on the human body and stuff. You have to go painter by painter and moment by moment, of course, you know. Um, I guess I wouldn't necessarily think first of Van Eyck as a humanist artist, although I can see why someone would. Um, it certainly is focused on the human world in a way, and it's kind of secularizing too, right? Like say the Van Ar the Arnolfini wedding portrait. Uh, it's it's a basically secular vision of uh, you know kind of bourgeois life or something almost, you know. And that's I, I guess we could call that humanism. But if we think of humanism primarily as a revival of antiquity, rediscover rediscovery of ancient texts and you know art objects and so on. I think it's a lot less so, and I think there's less emphasis or relentless emphasis on the human in the, in the North that's really very explicit because it's looking right at the artifactual environment, the natural environment, you know. Right, right. I, yeah, so... Yeah. so um, or genre painting. I mean, I'm not sure whether to regard that as humanist or... No, certainly, look, certainly a landscape, I would, you know. I mean, yeah. But, I mean, here's, so here's where I'm getting at... Um, and I think we're probably going to have to talk a little bit about what, what you take humanism to be, right? But, but here's what I, I – see, so to me, humanism is already beginning to emerge in Christianity itself in the late Middle Ages and is, become, is being expressed through a number of sort of theological transformations and practice transformations, most specifically and most especially something like the emergence of the cult of the virgin, right? Um, okay. um, which – which focuses the medieval mind on the humanity of Christ, whereas in the early okay. Middle Ages, it was always the risen Christ that was depicted. That's why you start getting depictions more of the crucified Jesus in, in, in art later in the Middle Ages than you had huh. in, early in the Middle Ages. And you get more emphasis on the, on, on the mother of Christ, which of course emphasizes the human dimension of, of Jesus. That then that, when you come from out, of the, out of the Middle huh. Ages into the Renaissance, that then has two different effects. In, in, the, in, in the Italian, it sort of coincides with the Greek revival that has partly to do with the revival of the language as well as yeah. interest in the literature. And in the North, it expresses itself more by way of a loving attention to the details of human life yes. and a very, realistic, a very realistic depiction of human uh, emotion with the aim of, ennob of, of representing it as, inno as ennobling quality. So I'm thinking of something like Van der Weyden's Descent from the Cross, mm -hmm. where the whole idea is to depict um, um, Mary as co-redemptio, right? So she's falling and she's fainting in the same posture that, the, that her dead son is falling off of the cross, right? Okay. But to me, that's profoundly humanistic. But it's done in a way – so in other words, there's two ways you can ennoble or celebrate the, humans, the human spirit, right? One way is through a sort of a, re a revival of an idealistic aesthetic. The other is through a very realistic depiction huh. of human pathos, emotion, mortality, right. mortality, all that sort of stuff. So have I convinced – Well, <laughs> you've interested me for sure. Like, okay, so does That's that – how I think of it, yeah. Yeah, okay, so say the cult of the virgin type of material – how does that does that flow directly into a kind of classical revival or is well i don't think it does but i think in other words i almost think that humanism took the form in Ital in the italian renaissance partly because the there was a serendipitous merging of the humanism already emerging within late medieval christianity within its within its theology and the classical revival that was the result of contingent factors that had to do with things like the Greek language coming back right. and sort of all these sorts of things. And so that's, that's the reason why, I, in other words, I think it's kind of an accident um, that the, the, the way that the, the humanism sort of manifested itself in Italy was, it was, an, as a, it was a, a result of, of a, co a coinciding of factors okay. that in, in the North, that's why I said the North is almost right. more like a smooth evolution out of the Gothic, right? In terms of the aesthetics. Right. Um, right. And whereas in Italy, it almost gets interrupted for one thing by the, like the presence of these, uh, you know, people from Byzantium and stuff yeah. like that. Like that's why I think the early Italian Renaissance painters are better than the late ones, right? So, like, 
you know, Giotto, I, Giotto's magnificent, right? Um, 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 as are, you know, I love Donatello, like, let's say, or yeah, uh, Pierre Della Francesca, I think, is yeah. amazing. Um, um, yeah. um, um, um but and they're closer that to looks more, yeah, it looks more medieval, though, doesn't yeah. it, right? Or it looks more northern, <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway. I don't know, yes, it does, yeah, right, but it also, you know. It has this devotion to realism that you certainly wouldn't find in uh, medieval yeah. art. And uh, it's, the, it's the depiction of human power. I mean, in the Middle Ages, yeah. the, the early Middle Ages, the, the human depictions were so flat and, 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 and stick figure-like precisely because all the values that were being articulated were transcendent values, right? Yes. Um, um, even to the point of the depiction of, G of Christ, there was no sort of, sort of indication for the most part of his suffering and of the pathos of the, it was all the risen Christ. You look at these very early crucifixions. He's sort of like, you know, the, you know, it's right. like, it's not this, you know, with, with the blood pouring. Yeah, or you, you know what I mean? It, 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 and this corresponds if you, if you teach the, if you know the history and the, the theology, this corresponds to a, an evolution of the theology through the middle ages that is tracked by evolution of the architecture. You start with a very dark besieged kind of architecture. Then it sort of opens up, becomes lighter. In other words, I would argue this sort of a sort of, this goes cuts across the different modalities of the civilization until um, you get to the Renaissance. And then the, the North and the, and the Italian split largely because of this coincidental revival of interest in classical okay. antiquity in Italy. That's the way I sort of have been looking at it at least. So, do you, all right, so I guess you're thinking of humanism as basically like a move off the celestial plane onto the human plane. A re-engagement with the dignity and the specialness right. of the human dimension, right? Which is, Which is not necessarily secularized. Humanism, what we mean by right. humanism, right? Right. But that's that, what I always thought it meant, right? And, and that's not necessarily secularizing because it no. moves through the humanity of Christ yeah. uh, into a... Okay, I you know I, I I okay I like this. That's the way I see humanism first being re-entering re into coming into Christianity in the Middle Ages, is the, by way of a rehumanization of of Jesus, right? Um, and and doing so by emphasizing emphasizing his mother, and by emphasizing the pathos of his experience, right? Um, right, but it's a little it's a little ironic to emphasize his mother and then promote her to Godhead kind of, you know what I mean? At the same time. In other words, like you, you could relentlessly humanize her. Yeah. And then you have a cult kind of maybe, but. Uh, well, but if you think about the, the things that the cult of the Virgin focused around, they were around Mary's role as co-sufferer and therefore co-redeemer. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, and so to me, these are almost, you know, if, if this makes any sense of idealizations of the human right. condition. Well, kind of God's girlfriend too, I guess, maybe, <laughs> right, right. or whatever. Don't but. say anything that's going to get our audience angry. All right, all right, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about how you're... Well, see, I, I guess yeah. I would have I thought of humanism more specifically as a set of developments that necessarily involves a classical. I mean, I, I guess I, I'm sort of loaded with this conventional interpretation of, of humanism as primarily a revival of the classical, you know, in which case I wouldn't have, that's why I was qualifying it with regard to Northern Europe or something yeah. like that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that my view is sort of, you know, uh, standard, but I will say that there's an awful lot of texts, historical texts about the Middle Ages that will talk about Christian humanism. And what they're talking about is the late Middle Ages yeah. and the emergence within Christianity of movements like Franciscanism yeah. and other developments that, in a sense, humanize and soften, soften the theology uh, in a way that makes it more focused on human concern, right? Yeah. Um, um, and less yeah. with... Every, everything about us is debased and corrupt and we're all waiting to go to heaven, right? I mean, that, that's sort of... Yeah. And part of the reason I don't like the Lutheran Reformation, the reversion, is because it goes back to a very dark, dour, in my view, very Pauline, um, strange right. religion. Uh, it's my least favorite part of it, right? I mean, well, that's... <laughs> I, I'll say this. You were just saying that it wasn't going back, however. Uh, it's true that they, you know, a lot of those Northern uh, Reformation figures relentlessly... Uh, emphasized original sin in a kind of, 
you know, Augustine sense or something like that. You don't get Puritans out of the Italian Renaissance. You get yeah. it out of the Northern, right? Can, can I say I have a certain sympathy with Puritanism? I mean, this is hard for me as a Quaker to say this. And as a hedonist, uh, I mean, how can you possibly? <laughs> a hedonist? You're, what, what kind of anarchist isn't a hedonist, for God's sake? <laughs> hey, hey, man, I'm an ascetic. Okay? Oh, God. It's been, it's been a journey. No, no. Hey, hey, there hey, goes my drinking partner. I thought I was gonna. I thought I was gonna get you. Hey, I've been through the uh, the other side of it. I uh, know. I'm just kidding you. Right. Go but on. I have a certain sympathy with the concept of original sin, even in a very, you know, what you might consider a dark and deterministic sense. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I mean, and I, I don't know. You're not this, a humanist. I no, I think not. Um, okay. okay. Yeah, you know, I very much am. I very much yeah. am. Um, um, no, yeah. I would directly describe myself as an anti-humanist in many senses, actually. Okay. okay. But we have to work on that. Okay. Like even Foucault. Well, I mean, this is this is such a vague term, though, and what that means. But it's also so interest. It's so interesting. I mean, I mean, yeah. Um, I, I sort of don't want a human-centered universe. I and I don't think that like, we have a particularly central role in this universe. Actually, that's one yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know and. Another thing I'd say is like, we suck, okay? Like, I think we are, you know, by our own moral standards or something like that, insofar as we can uh, clarify them, every single one of us is liable to be a miserable failure by those standards, man. Like, I look within and I see, you know, I, I this is not my vocabulary, man, but I, you know, if, if you said that I'm, there's something fundamentally wrong or something that is fundamentally going to keep me from being what in some sense I think I should be or things like that, or just look at human action. And I think that if you, you know, through history, it always has at best this double, uh, like, you know, it's impossible to tell if a saint is self-interested, man, like, or, or, you know, it's, yeah, and and I think we're liable to destroy this world, and I think that says something pretty devastating about what we are in deep inside. And I guess I I feel that vividly. Yeah, and then the celebration of the human, almost like inflation of it to Godhead in Michelangelo in Kant. In is uh, well, I don't, I'm just picking on Khan, I guess, because um, I, I do. But it just seems to me like it, it's a failure of self reflection, is the first thing I would say, you know. Um, but so, do you think, I mean, do you th look, I'm not. I'm not going to try to convince you to be a humanist, um, I'm not going to try to convince you to be anything, but uh, do you really think that I want to ask you two things about this? Do you really think that? <sighs> there cannot be a legitimate deep profound yet sober humanism um um because i don't think of my and maybe this comes too much from fixating on the italian renaissance right um mm -hmm. but but to me so can me let me give you an example for me the very idea of an ethics that has within it a deep commitment to sort of sympathy and benevolence right is to me an expression of, of humanism, right? I mean, I mean, and this is why I thought you were a humanist. My, the, the point about being an anarchist was kind of a joke, but it kind of wasn't, right? One of the things it seems to me in your work is that you were very concerned with the autonomy and the dignity of the individual human being. Sure. And I am. In what way is that not a humanist outlook? In your own mind, obviously. Why don't you self-identify, given that you feel so strongly about that, why do you not self-identify then as a humanist, albeit a sober and not a Michelangelo type one, right? Um, um, I do, I, I, am, I am very committed to the notion of the autonomy and, and maybe some sort of dignity of human beings. But in resistance to the incursions of human beings, um, I mean, the reason that I, I for example that I would say political power is always dangerous, many people agree with me on that, is that it's human beings who are operating it, okay? I think one thing is that 
we're very likely to invade one another's autonomy on the grounds of superiority or whatever. Um, and I think that's sort of intrinsic to human beings. Like, it's not that I think we are so great that, that I, I shouldn't be invaded. It's just that I think that y'all are suck so bad, just like I do, that you got no business invading me. Okay. Like if, if, if you know, if Hillary Clinton is going to tell me how to live or Donald Trump is going to tell me how to live or make the rules of who, who I pay what money to or something like that. Well, I don't recognize that they are any less flawed than I am, let's say. Um, so yours is, a, yours is a, um individual autonomy and dignity because uh, everybody is equally shitty. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so yeah. nobody should be having shittier than anybody else. <laughs> right. Yeah, like, prove to me that you're not as shitty as I am, and then I'll try to do what you're saying, man. But You're you the know. most cheerful, miserable person I've ever seen. I mean, it's just... <laughs> it is pretty bad. I know. I'm trying to smile through the pain, man. Um, so, I mean, one of the, th the things that... So, so I, you know, I see where you're getting, look... Italian Renaissance, especially Michelangelo, you're getting this sort of revival of this very idealized classical view of, of, of humanity, and then it gets sort of deployed, and, and there's this uncomfortable attempt to sort of synthesize that vision and all the sort of the pagan stuff that comes with it, yes. with Christianity, which you just think doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work aesthetically because you think it's it's sort of too pretty and too idealized and kind of makes makes a nonsense of of a lot of the subject matter, sure. and then like the Last Judgment or you know whatever, um, um, and then um, you think that in a sense there is a kind of a a kind of a symbolic invitation for something like the Reformation in this kind of in this kind I do. of right yeah you know, a um, symbolic demand in a way right I mean, right I, I think it's it's really quite interesting to think about all those developments in real, are they Christian developments? To what extent are they Christian developments? So again, I'm looking at like, say some, a figure like Ficino. Um, Good. And, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're getting into this. Cause I want to ask you about Christianity and humanism directly, yeah, not just about the, yeah. so go on, go on. It's, it, Lord knows it's a, it's a large, difficult area and I'm no expert on humanism. Okay. Um, but okay. So, you have this pagan revival. Obviously, there's tension between the two symbol, symbol systems, let's say. If you're Botticelli, for instance, you know, you're going to face the accusation that you're no longer a Christian. Right. Because, you know, you're depicting these pagan goddesses and this. Yeah. Hot naked nymphs coming out of yes. clams and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and that was a straight up, it was a crisis, right? Like Savonarola, right? He's, he, he's saying like, these are blasphemous. Let's burn them. These people have become pagans again. Now, I think that that's a hard, you know, like you can't, you certainly can't say that about every humanist. I mean, someone like Erasmus is about as sincere a Christian as you can imagine or whatever. And I would argue as a humanist. Yes, completely. And, 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 and had these famous debates with Luther I mean, that's part of the, that's one of my reasons for sort of pushing against your notion that humanism is inconsistent with Christianity, right? Because some of the greatest, some of, in my view, the greatest heroes yes. of Christian thought historically have been the humanists, including, okay. I mean, Erasmus is yeah. like near the top of my list. I'm, I'm not saying that humanism as a whole is necessarily incompatible with Christianity. I think there's, you know, there's always liable to be some tensions between, say, the classical material and the Christian material. Some of them are perfectly aware of that. But, but someone like Ficino, who I think is directly leads to the Italian high Renaissance, it like sort of is the intellectual uh, progenitor of the Italian Renaissance in many ways. He also is constantly declaring himself to be a Christian, but in a situation where if you are not, okay, if, you, if people successfully persuade people that you are not a Christian, your works will be suppressed and you're liable to be burned at the stake or whatever. Okay. I think he's a Platon, a Platonist. And that if he could have left Christianity behind, he would have, although it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a little like maybe coming to the end of Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion. And he hits, the, of course we must accept this on faith. And you're going, I wonder if that's sincere really. And, and the same with Ficino. I think of him as, yeah, you know, he's engaged in all this like ancient magical practices as he understands it, all these kind of hermetic 
ideas. He's reviving the classical things. He's, he's making a cult of the text of a symposium, I think. Uh, and it's vision of beauty and all this, which is the Neoplatonic text par excellence. I think that that's, if you want to understand Neoplatonism, you've got to read this symposium. But I, I think that there, and Michelangelo, I think, is very directly trying to take that program into the Vatican in, in, on the walls. And, you know, I, right, I think there could be historical tensions that are never resolved, okay? Like, I don't think, you might think of Michelangelo's beautiful synthesis, synthesis of these two traditions. I see it as an enactment of a terrible contradiction that at this extreme formulation, say Luther versus Ficino or something, cannot be resolved. And um, you know, or it's, yeah, well, there's it's more extreme. Like, there's more extreme than Luther, and that's Calvin. So I would almost say yeah. Calvin versus Ficino and Luther versus Erasmus. So sort of like the sort of like the relatively mainstream version of this split, and then sort of the. The, right. the, the pol the polar the polar uh, uh, the split at its sort of polarities right um, yeah. um, so that but that makes for an internal incoherence in the work of, of Michelangelo let's say I mean I would compare it to something like the founding fathers in relation to slavery okay like they have these beautiful ideals and stuff like this sounds good um, but there's a tension at the heart of their belief system that's just excruciating and, and it's only worked out in a war. But you know isn't, I mean? that, isn't that the most common thing in the world? And that is that an idealization that then has to be implemented in practice and institutions is always going to sort of get chipped away by the sort of sort of prudential and pragmatic and other sort of considerations. And in other words, in other words, I mean, we know why we had we we got slavery, and it was because of all these complex negotiations having to do with you know going from the Articles of Confederation right. to the to the federal constitution and all of that. And so, you know, it was, you kind of like, okay, well, you know, we have this idealized vision and blah, blah, but you know, which, how much of it are we going to get if we right. do this? And if we do that, in other words, isn't that just sort of the most ordinary thing in the world when everyone tries to implement an idea, especially in a complex system, right? Right. As opposed to some sort of, um, uh, uh, how shall we say a very, um, um, unique or special kind of uh, 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 tension or incompatibility or great clashing. I mean, isn't this just what happens when you try to implement an idea in an institution, right? Sure. Which I know you're against institutions, but <laughs> no, I'm not against you have them, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm not against institutions, that's Sarah. Um, as long as they're volunteer. Uh, <laughs> right. All right. But um, one thing I'm saying is that I think there can be irreconciled non-reconciled fundamental tension in history. Okay, so like as opposed to a Hegelian version of history or whatever, which specifically regards the Italian high renaissance as a beautiful synthesis. I think of it more like an either or that can't be synthesized, you know? Uh, like it's a fundamental tension. Now, I think that in a way that makes, that could make the art even more interesting in a way, right? Like. It, it, it doesn't refute the art in itself to emerge from this tension, but I, I'm not sure Michelangelo, for example, successfully resolves it. I think he just... Yeah, I think he was actually a better sculptor than a painter. And I well, think I, agree, I agree. He's I agree. painting like he makes sculptures. Um, there's actually a, 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 there actually was, I don't know if it's still there, but a, last time I was in New York over the Christmas break, there's a major Michelangelo yeah. retrospective at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yes. I don't know if you ever get down to New York. It is worth it's worth going to see. Um, I haven't seen that. Yeah, the drawing, right? The drawing. Uh, yes, and it's vast, and it includes and the, the drawing context. is pretty incredible. And it includes the context, so there's a lot of the other artists that are around at the time in the circle, maybe the less well known ones, and so it really brings a lot of depth um, to it. Um, um, okay, let's. This I think the last thing I want to get talk to is this last thing you just came to, and that is the basic question of Christianity classical antiquity and civilization and humanism. Yeah. Um, so it's my view. And, and, you know, it's funny, the more we talk through this, I think we could have actually a really interesting conversation just about the idea of original sin. And because, I, you know, as someone who's raised in the Jewish, Jewish tradition, um, and although I'm not a practicing, uh, practicing Jew in terms of observances, I'm very much culturally sort of ethos wise in a lot of ways. And, 
for Jews, the whole doctrine of original sin is, is very strange, okay? Um, it, it, as a matter of fact, some of the Jewish commentaries on Genesis, the modern ones, mention the strange and ominous doctrines that the <laughs> Christian church has foisted upon Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, to me, Genesis is, not, is simply a parable of, what, of, of maturity, right? of, of what it is to mature as a person, right? And so, in other words, in other words you can't... Well, there is a fall. You can't, with, you know, in other words, you know, there are consequences to knowledge and growing up. In other words, I do, Jews don't view Eden as the ideal state, right? Um, um, uh, Jews, Jews, Jews view, view, view Eden as the beginning of man's moral agency. And for Jews, God created man as, uh, to, in order to bring that moral agency to bear on the world, to create moral institutions on the Maybe earth. Maybe Milton had a similar view, for example. Um, yeah, and so, so I just, to me, the whole talk of original sin and fallenness and all of this stuff is very strange, and it's, it's just not part of my ethos. And so, to me, I view Western humanism as having two sources, Jerusalem and Athens. I think both are humanistic. They're just humanistic in different ways. Okay. Both are humanistic in at the heart of it is that both view human beings as having a divine element and thus being special and significant in a way right. that reflects that, right? Um, and I don't know if you read this piece. I, I suggested to you this piece by Bernard Williams called The Human Prejudice, but at the beginning... Oh, shoot, I didn't read it, though. Okay, ah, it wasn't an assignment, but I just... I, I sent it to I'll you. Sure, I sent it to you because this was a line that I want to push, right? And that is that whether you take the Luther view or you take the much more optimistic sort of view, either way, human beings are of central significance and importance, right? I mean... It, you wouldn't talk so much about their fallenness if it didn't matter that they were fallen, right? Um, 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 well, we are human beings, you know. They're going to be important to us. Yeah, but that's another thing that Bernard Williams points out, and that is that's all there is is important to us. The, the notion of important period is just, in his view, incoherent, and I would, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I don't know what it means to just matter in general. I know what it means to matter to someone. I know what it means right. to matter to something. I don't know what it just means to matter. That just, that just, that's just to me, that's to almost ungrammatical, it seems to well, me. Well, maybe each thing matters to itself, or maybe each species matters to itself in some way. Or Yeah, but I mean, to matter seems to me requires pretty advanced capacities of representation, okay. right? Um, um, and so what I want to say is that Judaism and Christianity are themselves inherently humanistic, and Christianity even more so. For God's sake, they embodied the divine into a human being. I yes. mean, how much more humanistic, if you're talking symbolically, right? How much more humanistic can you freaking get, right? Okay. And where the pathos of human life and death is at the center of cosmic struggle, right? And is, is, and is, and is at the root of redemption, right? This, to me, is profoundly humanistic. Okay. And then as you get into the Middle Ages... They're trying to work out how that all how that all supposed to work, and it sort of waxes and wanes in a human more humanist than less humanist direction, finally sort of settling into a kind of a mature late medieval Christianity that's that that has this sort of all fleshed out. Um, in terms of the incompatibility of you know you're talking about Ficino and it's like you know I think he's I, I think if he could he could have sort of quit and all of that. I don't see why the Platonism. I mean, to me, Platonism is one of the friendliest elements of, of, of Greek antiquity to Christianity. There's a ton of Neoplatonism in original and early Christianity. And sure. Augustine was a Platonist. Yeah, right? I understand that. Yeah. Um, um, Aquinas is an Aristotelian. Yes. Philo Judeus is a Platonist. And a lot of that, that's why you get so much Hellenization of Judaism in that period, right? And so I, the incompatibility you're seeing, to, you're seeing I see as something that, is, the, is actually the opposite. It's a synthesis. You don't get Christianity and Judaism without, you don't get Christianity and rabbinic Judaism without the Hellenization of ancient Hebrew religion, right? You don't get it. It's the product of that synthesis. Um, and okay. it's the product of Hellenization. And, um, and so... I think it's also a attack. Yeah, you go ahead. I'm talking too long, but yeah. that's, that's, no, that's, why good. That's, good. that's why I'm pushing back against right. your saying that... We're the the picture. Yeah, we got to get the pictures out in, you know, to some extent, so it's, it's going to take a little while. All right. One lens I would read this through is Nietzsche, okay, who, you know, regards the, uh, you know, regards Christianity as, you know, slave rebellion in morality, a rebellion against 
you know, primarily Roman values and, and, you know, hence, uh, and, 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 and hence Greek values, I suppose as well. Um, and I think that there's a very different vision of, for one thing, there's a entirely different ethics in Christianity than say in Aristotle. Like, I don't think they ever worked that out very well, like even Aquinas. Uh, I mean, you got to first of all decide whether pride is a sin or pride is a virtue, things like this. Uh, if you look at, you know, Homer in relation to the Gospels or something like that. I think you see globally different uh, value systems, entirely incompatible. One coming from the top and one coming of a warrior culture and one coming from the bottom of a peasant culture. Um, but that's even true within classical antiquity. I mean, if you compare yes. Homer to Aristotle's sort of cosmos, I mean, one of the things I teach my students is that what's so remarkable about the Nicomachean ethics is that not very long after the Homeric sort of period, you you move from an idealization of sort of Achilles as the sort of the, as the sort of as you you know Eudaimonia is sort of ma is personified by Achilles to eudaimonia being personified by statesmen and scholars, right? Now, that to me is, is a, a remarkable transformation just within oh, classical antiquity. Oh, certainly true. Certainly um, true. I mean, okay. But I, do, I think that in some sense, Christianity was a self-conscious rejection of a lot of these sort of values. Now, if we want to describe them as humanistic on both ends, that's possible, I suppose. Uh, humanistic in quite different senses, you know. One, I mean, for one thing, the, the emphasis on the suffering of that it, to be human is to suffer is one is one of the messages of the Gospels and stuff like that. And there is some kind of trans, way to transcend that. But that boy, that doesn't sound much like uh, Greek. Any real Greek philosophy I could think of. It well, does sound like Greek. It sounds like some Greek plays. Yeah, that's true. That's that's quite true. I, the uh, other thing I would say about it's definitely true that Plato is in and out of Christianity from very early. And it's also true that, I mean, I even really like people like Iris Murdoch is trying to still oh, work. God, I love her. I love her. Yeah. yeah. But, and, and there's a lot to be said for Plato, the monotheist, right? And Plato, uh, however, that's a pretty different kind of God, man. That's a oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that that's the form of goodness, truth, beauty, and justice that is eternal and unchanging and definitely doesn't intervene in uh, human affairs, okay? Yeah. If yeah. you can aspire to uh, rise toward that, but you can't, you can't petition it for a release from suffering or something like that. Um, and so I think these tensions, I mean, it's, I think it's an immensely complex terrain. But I would definitely think of the basic value system as expressed in early Christianity as fundamentally incompatible with Greek and Hellenistic philosophy. But but then the, how do you explain? I mean, look, let's say that's. I don't necessarily disagree with that as the way you put it, but it's simply not disputable as as a sort of historical religious theological matter that rabbinical Judaism and Christianity, as we understand it, are, are products of a sustained period of Hellenized, Hellenized Judaism, as okay. well as syncretism with Judaism of Babylonian and Persian, uh, uh, Persian influences, right, okay. um, um, that result from the various exiles that the, that the Hebrews suffered. In other words, on the one hand, you don't get Christianity without the Hellenization of Judaism. On the other hand, I agree with you that there are certain dimensions of Christianity that, you know, are as at odds with classical Greek civilization as right. you can imagine. So the question then is what's the sort of proper way to sort of think about the relationship between the two civilizations? Well, if you, but, but if you say rabbinic Judaism is inconceivable, you know, outside of this Hellenistic context, I would right. agree. But you've also got to recognize that the teachings of Jesus are an attack on rabbinic Judaism. But they're also coming from within it. I mean, yes. G, G, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I think I think that um, you know, it's, very difficult, it's very difficult to say. You know what Jesus was, but I think he, he was more. Funnily enough, was more probably of a Pharisee than anything else um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the sort of the orientation. Look, he's not. He flirts with Essenic ideas, right? I mean, I mean, there are sort of apocalyptic and other sorts of, but a lot of the sort of the the humanism. <laughs> 
Look, 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 yes. the golden rule comes from Hillel. It's not original to, to, to. Okay. Right? Yes. Um, 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 uh, I think that this, I think that the, 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 ex, the idea of the sort of the hostility of Christianity towards Phariseeism is, I think, complicated and overstated and unfortunately. Um, well, it's pretty direct in the text, right? Yeah, but, but the text, look, these yeah. texts, these the are not. Pharisees. You these are not historical texts, Pharisees. though. I mean, these are, these are in many ways uh, pro pro political texts, right? I mean, we know how ancient these ancient texts were written. We know, I mean, you know, I just, I would never read an ancient text straight like that. Right. Um, 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 no ancient text. Uh, I wouldn't read Thucydides straight like that. I wouldn't read the New Testament straight okay. like that. Okay. Yeah, I know. Um, um, but he's cussing out Pharisees, and those are pretty central texts. You know what I mean? Well, I agree. I agree yeah. with that. But at the same time, the ethos he's expressing is the ethos articulated by rabbinical sages like Hillel. <laughs> right. Okay. So maybe it's a revival, like as Luther conceived a revival of uh, pure Christianity or whatever. Yeah. I mean, he's conceiving a revival of pure Judaism. That's one way to look at it. Maybe he's criticizing, you know, institutional developments and frameworks that have, you know, yeah, in a lot of ways, he also reminds me of some of the prophetic tradition from the Hebrew Bible. Right. I mean, yes. Um, which are always these sort of corrective forces um, but are always in tandem with the institutional forces. They never come, they never, they're, 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 they function as correctives, not as, as dismantlers. Right. Okay. Um, 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 and, and, and if you think that the natural course Christianity had to take was some form of institutionalization, once the world didn't end, right. then there's a similar tension in Christianity that you're going to have, you would expect to have a similar kind of back and forth between the inst forces of institution and the and the and the and the corrective forces, right? Um, right, but those institutionalizations are always a temptation to betray the most basic values. I think. Yeah, but without them, you don't have really sort of a civilization, right? I mean, you 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 you. Okay. Yes. At least it seems to me. Um, um, this last thing about humanism. So, the way I see this is that. Both, let's just say Judaism slash Christianity, because in this re this regard, I don't think that there's that there's that much tension between Judaism and Christianity. Okay. Judaism slash Christianity, Jerusalem has its own brand of humanism that comes from the idea of man's creation, his role, and and the divine element in him, um, and it, and it emphasizes its humanism is expressed through emphasizing certain human characteristics, calling them out for special notice. Um, Greek antiquity is also humanistic, okay. but it's expressed okay. in a different set of human, by way of a different set of human characters. In other words, a different set of human characters are focused upon um, to express the special standing of human beings, right? Like the beautiful, guess, perfect body or whatever. That's right. And I guess that I, I and the heroic mode and, and yes. the pride versus humility. In other words, what I'm saying is, to me, I could see both pride and humility as being expressions of humanism. And in a sense, the tension that you're perceiving in the Middle Ages, I'm sorry, in the Renaissance, is a tension between the different expressions of humanism rather than between a humanistic civilization and a non-humanistic one. That's the way I see it. Um, and I'm wondering if what your objection is to that or why, why you think that that's not the better, best way to see it. Well, if you do centralize the flaws of human beings, if you do centralize original sin, uh, and I mean, I think you end up with a quite a different value. Do you think that that's not humanistic? Well, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. It's human centered, right? It's about us. Um, but I, and I also Isn't think the that focus on our suffering. I mean, doesn't that imply that the suffering matters? I mean, I'm thinking of, think about contemporary arts. Yes. Okay? Think about a photographer like Nan Golden, right? Yes. Um, who or or or, or um, um, uh, uh, the de you know depictors of of the poor and the down you know you know liter the sort of literature that that that's concerned with the poor and the downtrodden sure. um, or the marginal, right? Low bear even or like. I, 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 I think that that's profoundly humanist art because the elevation. <laughs> Lucian Freud, right? I mean, you know, the, the presentation of the ugly in the frankest possible way, right? Um, to a certain extent, ennobles us even in our flaws, right? I mean, and it's, what it shows is like, you know, what a beautiful thing this is, even if it's not be traditionally beautiful, right? Or classically beautiful, right? It's worth looking at. You're not hiding it. You're not, you're not putting it behind a curtain, right? 
here we are, here I am, warts and all, right? Uh, to me, that's that's profoundly humanistic. Um, um, well, I don't know. I mean, what's not humanistic then? I mean, so is misanthropy human humanistic or? No, uh, no, I, I, I don't think that that's misanthropic. Right. I think it's the opposite of misanthropic. It's it's the yeah, ethics of fitting. Well, not Lucian Freud. I'm talking about. Yeah. I said um, first. I said Nan Golden. Nan Golden. Yeah. Um, right. um, but one um, thing I just want to say in general is like I want to be as interested in the non-human as in the human world. I think we're related to the non-human just as profoundly, just as with just as much ethical content, just as continuously as we are to the human world. Uh, and I think like one problem is that our ethics has been so human centered that we haven't taken any other kind of things seriously ethically or even think they counted whatsoever unless they were moral persons, which we define an imitation to ourselves. Yeah. Another thing I would say about the humanistic tradition is that it really tends to, to yield prodigies of pride. Okay, so I see you're saying like the other side of it can also be a humanistic, and I, I, and I hope so. I mean, I guess, or I think so, or I don't know what I think about that. But I'm concerned, like I like, what, the reason I like original sin is because the doctrine of original sin is it keeps you humble. You know, if you're Augustine, you're sitting there going like, well, maybe I don't know after all, right? Because I'm fundamentally flawed. Maybe I shouldn't, like, seize power over this uh, peninsula or something like that because I'm no more likely to do right than they are, you know? Uh, and so I, I, if we're questioning ourselves, I think that you can get to the point where it's self-destructive, I've been to this point where it's self-loathing rather than, uh, you know, something that drives you forward. But I just, I feel like the humanist tradition, as you see in the arts often, if it's Michelangelo or whatever, exalts the human beyond anything that I can recognize in my family and friends and in my introspection, you know? Yeah. Um, And I think that's dangerous. I think we've suffered from that in a way. Yeah. Um, um, No, that's fair. And, 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 you know, these are the, these are, part of the reason I like these subjects so much is they're the sorts of subjects in which it's so clear that there is not a conclusive uh, answer, that there is not a single obviously correct position, um, um, that this is exactly the sort of thing that I think philosophy should be about. Yeah. Um, um, and it drives you to your, into yourself, too, these kinds of questions. Yeah, too, it forces yeah. you to really think in, in big terms and also... Um, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 that's why I like the essay so much. I mean, I disagreed with all of it, <laughs> but, but it, it, it pushed every button that I'm interested in. Um, um, and to me, that's much cool. more valuable than finding somebody I agree with. Right. <laughs> me too. I agree with you on that, man. Um, and I've learned a lot just right here, right now. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Just think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, you know, I, I, it's so fascinating to me to, to, to have the intersection of two people who come to this from a different background of education, a different set of literary influences, as well as a different religious background. And you see where it goes. Right. And, 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 you know, I'm Puritan on one side and Jewish on the other, which is fascinating. And one day maybe we'll talk about that. I'd be interested one day in hearing a little bit about your Jewish background. Cause I did not, that's something I didn't know. Is that through your mother's side or your father's side? My mother's side. So you're really Jewish. I am. <laughs> yeah. And I married a couple of Jewish women, and it's a good thing that I counted as Jewish when I did too. <laughs> well, Crispin, I want to thank you so much for this. Thanks, man. I really enjoyed it. I could go on for Great. another hour, but Me I too. know you have things to do. Two hours right now. And our audience attention span probably wouldn't last that long. But um, uh, I'm really happy that you're continuing to do these with me. I'm really feeling, I'm really feeling like we're developing a nice relationship in these dialogues. And I, um, I really enjoy them a lot. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. We'll talk to you soon, Chrisman. Take care. Bye.